It's the deadliest day of the pandemic. 46 lives lost in New South Wales, among them a newborn baby. But tonight, fresh signs the virus spread is slowing. The border decision that's devastated thousands, but the WA Premier doubling down. Four people arrested over the alleged abduction of a young girl in Sydney's northwest. The COVID safe mission to deliver urgent supplies to the people of Tonga. Plus, top seed Denil Medvedev blasts the Australian Open crowd after a fiery clash with Nick Kyrgios. This is Nine News with Charles Croucher. Good evening on our deadliest day of the pandemic as 46 families are mourning the loss of loved ones, a glimmer of hope tonight. The spread of the virus through New South Wales appears to be slowing, with hospital and intensive care numbers showing signs of stabilising. Of all the numbers in all the Premier's press conferences, today carried the worst. Sadly today uh, we're reporting the deaths of 46 people. The deadliest day of the pandemic in New South Wales. Seven lives lost over the past three weeks included in today's grim figure after coronial investigations. And the parents of an eight week old baby who died with the virus at John Hunter Hospital waiting on further tests to determine if COVID or something else claimed their newborn's life. The coroner and the forensic pathologists that support the coroner are working very hard to get the answers that most importantly the family want. From me to them, uh, uh, there's nothing worse than losing a child. So my really sincere condolences. The number of people dying from the virus is sadly predicted to remain high for the next few weeks, but the Premier is seeing reassuring signs. From a hospitalisation perspective today and from an ICU perspective, uh, we continue to track better uh, than our best case uh, scenario. There are 2,534 people with COVID in the state's hospitals. Worst case modelling put that figure at 6,000. In the ICUs, 209 people. That number was forecast to be as high as 600. A plateauing of people in hospital and ICU uh, has occurred this week. We're obviously watching that data very closely and seeing particularly what the next few days bring to us. We look at the hospitalisations, the ICU, um, staff furloughing, staff absenteeism, our testing data, our case positivity. That all gives us a sense that the spread of COVID is slowing. Cases are turning a corner. The state racking up another 25,168 positives from PCR testing and self-reported rapid antigen tests. From today, boosters can be given just three months after the second shot. 32.3% of adults are so far triple jabbed. We would love to see a huge roll up this weekend uh, to get vaccinated with that booster. While almost 94% of the population is now double vaxxed, half of the 28 people under the age of 65 who died from COVID in the last week were not. Close to 50% of those people in ICU who are unvaccinated, it's very, very clear. Vaccinations work, boosters work. If you're under 65, think that your health conditions are not severe or you're not going to have a severe disease, think again. The data is clear. Please get vaccinated. A health system under strain and on the state's deadliest day of the pandemic so far, the Premier was asked if he had any regrets or if he would do anything differently in light of the Omicron surge. The easy approach to stop transmission is to lock down. That's the wrong approach. It's the hard, this is the hard, this is the hard way. This is the hard way and I accept that. I believe he still doesn't get it. The modest restrictions that were removed on the December 15th, just over a month ago, fueled the Omicron crisis. Lizzie Pearl, Nine News. A border may just be a dotted line on a map, but tonight it's never felt more like a brick wall, with families locked out of Western Australia indefinitely. Today, Mark McGowan justified his tough stance, his state dealing with two potential Omicron outbreaks. Hearts breaking collectively across the country. I miss her. Um, I can't hold her. I can't smell her hair. I can't tell her I love her to her face. Jeanette O'Keefe hasn't seen her daughter Julia or her 88-year-old dad for three years. Devastation also felt by Jodie, cut off from her loved ones in Western Australia. My heart is aching. The hardest part is my heart is aching. I want, to, I want to see my daughter. I want to see my granddaughter. 
Fortress WA forcing families apart for even longer. Hopes built on this announcement. Today I can announce that WA will ease its hard border arrangements at 12.01am Saturday the 5th of February. Now shattered. When Mark McGowan announced the 5th of February, that date was locked in. And no matter what happened, that date was locked in. And now he's gone back on his word. And I just actually can't believe it. Tears shed across the globe. Elizabeth Yardley lives in the UK. She hasn't seen her daughter or granddaughters for two years. Missing every milestone so far for her grandson Rory, who is now 16 months old. We've never been able to hold him as a baby. We've not been able to feed him or, you know, change his nappy or anything like that. And that's all just been ripped away from us. Sarah Watson lives in Perth, cut off from family and friends interstate and overseas. She started this petition in a desperate attempt to get Premier McGowan to reconsider. I just want them people to know that they're not on their own. We've gone through hell and back. So fed up, she's considering leaving WA after calling Perth home for 12 years. I'm too angry to be upset at the moment. While many others in the West are supportive of the hard border, relieved it's been extended. Public hospitals, the private hospitals, the clinics, the communities, disabilities, aged care. I think we can all agree that they're not quite re they're not ready yet for the Omicron surge. The Business Council, on the other hand, says the longer restrictions stay in place, the bigger the damage to the economy and to people's mental health and well-being. Premier McGowan has shut the border indefinitely, saying he wants further modelling. Very few people will be allowed in with exemptions if they are triple vaxxed, but waiting for a boosted level of immunity across the state could see them facing a more severe outbreak. If they delay, they may get a worse variant next time around. There's no guarantee that the relatively mild Omicron will be the same next time. It could even be more severe. A decision keeping Mark McGowan from his own elderly parents in northern New South Wales, who he's only seen once since the start of the pandemic. More than the thousands of other families still waiting, who are losing hope. And it's just going on and on and on, and it's just devastating. It's just so upsetting for everybody, and, and there's no end to it, there's no hope. Sophie Upcroft, Nine News. Businesses overcharging for rapid antigen tests are now in the crosshairs of federal police. The AFP is investigating allegations of price gouging in New South Wales and Queensland. Retailers marking up tests by more than 20% face five years in jail. A four-year-old girl has been abducted from a suburban street at Stanhope Gardens near Kellyville. Zara James is live at the scene. Zara, four people have now been arrested. That's right, Charles. The four-year-old girl was standing on a street here in Stanhope Gardens with her father at 12.20 today when a Honda CRV pulled up and two people got out of the car. It's alleged the man tried to distract her father while police allege a woman put the little girl in the car. The car was tracked by police up the M1 and two hours later it was stopped at Beresford. Two women who were known to the little girl and two men were arrested. The little girl was thankfully found safe and uninjured and she is expected to be reunited with her father tonight while the four people in the car are speaking with police, Charles. A harrowing ordeal, Zara James, live for us tonight. Thank you. In a time of terrible trouble, Tonga is clinging to one moment of triumph, a man surviving 28 hours at sea after Saturday's tsunami. The island nation is also taking strength from the first supplies of Australian aid. And tonight, news HMAS Adelaide is on the way. A breakthrough moment for the ash-covered nation. From Amberley home base to Tonga, with a reminder of home on their shoulder, a web of Australian aid is carefully unloaded from the belly of a C-17. The cargo plane packed with supplies, water, generators, communications gear and tarps. The mission, COVID safe and contactless. Aid workers clad in PPE to stop the spread of a virus which Tonga has so far kept out. Rewarding being on the first mission in, but there's a lot more work to be done. There are tough conditions on the ground. The C-17s will struggle with the 
ash that's still in the air. And while the main airport has finally been cleared, ash from the volcanic eruption still presenting risks to drinking water and air quality. Around 80% of the population affected by the disaster. Military muscle now also en route, with HMAS Adelaide streaming towards Tonga. From the Queen, condolences. I'm shocked and saddened. My thoughts and prayers are with the people of Tonga. People like Lasala Falau, the so-called miracle man, who spent 28 hours at sea after being swept off the isolated island of Atata during Saturday's tsunami before drifting to the mainland a day later. He says he came back to make up the numbers lost from the island. Early Walsh, Nine News. A warning, the following vision is distressing. This is the moment a truck with failing brakes speeds towards cars and motorbikes stopped at a red light in Borneo, Indonesia. Next, it ploughs into the waiting traffic, slamming into at least six cars and 14 motorbikes. Five people were killed in the horror accident, with many others injured. For two years, we've been swamped by COVID statistics, but all those facts, all those figures have a human face. One Sydney family struggling with the suspension of elective surgery symbolises so many who feel they need medical help now. <laughs> Bright and bubbly, 10-month-old Jensen is developing every day. But surgery to fix his cleft palate has been cancelled, leaving parents Kate and Joel from Reevesby worried he's been left behind. I'm disappointed that it feels like his situation is not important enough. It's taken a huge emotional toll on our family going through this journey. The Blackets are one of thousands of families across the state now living in limbo after the state government suspended non-urgent procedures on the 7th of January. Our lives are on hold. I haven't gone back to work this year waiting for him to have this surgery so that I can care for him. You know you have a system at breaking point when young children have their surgery cancelled. Specialist workers from speech pathologists to physiotherapists are being forced to cancel appointments and take up frontline pandemic roles. That the way we make space for COVID and the way we make capacity for COVID is by pausing other care uh, and we need to find a different way forward and a way to get back to providing the whole of the healthcare system. In the second quarter of 2021, nearly 65,000 elective surgeries were performed. In the following three months, that number slipped to 44,000 amid new restrictions during the Delta lockdown. Now, with these current measures in place, experts are worried surgery numbers could decline even more. When we suspended the non-urgent surgery, we said we would review that in the middle of February. Uh, so that's still our intention. Uh, obviously, it's highly dependent on what happens with respect to hospitalisations. Jensen is hoping to have his operation at the end of March. At this stage, nothing is guaranteed. James Wilson, Nine News. A close call for residents in this property on Sydney's North Shore, a boarding house at North Ride bursting into flames. Three people were inside when the fire broke out but managed to escape. One was taken to hospital with minor injuries. American and European leaders have held crisis talks on Ukraine, putting on a united front to dissuade Russia from invading its neighbour. But tonight, new images show both sides preparing for conflict. Moscow's latest show of force. Unveiling a new submarine, tanks and missile launches. The build-up of military might near Ukraine's border captured in satellite photos as Ukraine's defence force flexed back, releasing video of its own troops conducting drills near Crimea. The White House strengthening its warning to Vladimir Putin. If any, any assembled Russian units move across the Ukrainian border, that is an invasion. But it will be met with severe and coordinated economic response. Biden backpedaling after this comment yesterday suggested division among NATO allies. And it depends on what it does. It's one thing if it's a minor incursion and then we end up having a fight about what to do and not do, etc. Sparking a furious response from Ukraine's president, we want to remind the great powers that there are no minor incursions. 
the US Secretary of State smoothing over tensions in crisis talks with European allies. It's bigger than Russia and NATO. It's a crisis with global consequences. I think that that would be a uh, disaster for not just for Ukraine, but for Russia, it would be a disaster for the world. Hoping to fend off war through diplomacy and sanctions, but Washington has now authorised the transfer of US-made weapons into Ukraine. Why are you waiting on Putin to make the first Thank move, you. sir? In the United States, Amelia Adams, Nine News. Meantime, the Morrison government says it will not be committing troops to support Ukraine. The threat of Russian invasion was central to talks between senior Australian and British foreign ministers in Sydney today. Four leaders, two countries in Australia's backyard. Very nice thing. Renewing an old friendship. No better friend in defence do we have than Australia. The first face-to-face -face meeting of its kind in Australia since the pandemic. And it's nice to, in large part, have a return to situation normal. The world is far from normal. Russia is threatening Ukraine amassing troops on the border. The Australian government says it will consider support to Ukraine, but not from our military. That is not uh, on the table from Australia's perspective. In a speech after the talks, the UK Foreign Secretary had a warning for President Putin. And step back from Ukraine before he makes a massive strategic mistake. But Russia is not the only concern. Russia and China are working together more and more. Regional security a focus for the Australian government. The Chinese government's been very clear about uh, their intent with Taiwan. The so-called AUKUS arrangement is seeking to counter China's aggression and with Australia to secure nuclear-powered submarines, more visits from the British Navy are expected. Beijing's expansion is also a focus for the Prime Minister, who signed a half a billion dollar deal to help Papua New Guinea upgrade its ports. With concerns over how Beijing and Moscow are challenging the world order, Australia and the UK have pledged to strengthen security ties, work closer on infrastructure, cyber security and tackling misinformation. It is incredibly important that countries that share values like the United Kingdom and Australia stand up once again. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Jonathan Kersley, Nine News. Serbia has scrapped Rio Tinto's licence for a $3.3 billion lithium mine project in the country. The decision follows weeks of protests against the mine. It also comes days after Novak Djokovic was deported from Australia. The tennis star had posted his support for the protesters on Instagram. An Iraqi refugee who served more than two years over the indecent assault of a girl at the Homebush DFO centre has had his conviction overturned. His future, however, remains in the balance, now waiting to see if he faces a new trial and whether he'll be allowed to stay in Australia. Many people would remember these images. Muhammad al-Biati and a little girl walking down a corridor and then disappearing out of view. The DFO security guard has always maintained he was helping the lost child find her mother at Homebush in December 2016. The jury in his first trial was unable to reach a verdict. But at the second, al-Biati was found guilty of three charges, including aggravated indecent assault. The Iraqi refugee appealed, and today, more than five years on from the shopping centre encounter, those convictions were quashed. A retrial audit on the two lesser offences. Al Bayati has already served his minimum two and a half year sentence. He was eligible for parole last July, but remains behind bars. It's yet to be seen if he'll make a bid for release or if the DPP will pursue a third trial. His permanent residency has been cancelled while in prison. Tiffany Genders, Nine News. All right, Sophie is here now with a look at today's weather and Sophie, the sun was trying to poke through today. <laughs> yes, Charles, we had glimpses but not a lot. It was another one of those days where it looked like winter but felt a whole lot warmer. Cloudy and muggy. A smattering of showers arrived mid-afternoon. So far, 3.6 millimetres falling in the city, 3 millimetres at Terry Hills. The city warmed up to 26.1 degrees today, which is bang on average for this time of year. The mercury only managing 24.9 in our west, though. That's 4 degrees 
degrees under 25 degrees for Penrith and Richmond, making it their coolest January spell in six years. There will be a few showers tomorrow, but most likely around the northern half of the coast and ranges. Full forecast a little later, Charles. Looking forward to it, Soph. Thank you. Well, 10.30 last night on a street in South Granville, a BMW explodes, the culprit caught in the blast, gunshots heard nearby. There's a full story that's coming up. Also tonight, viewers stunned as a reporter is hit by a car on live TV. Commonwealth Bank staff demanding millions over lost tea breaks. And crowd control at the Australian Open. Fans under fire, but is it all part of the sport? We're at Melbourne Park next.